Welcome to this episode of What's New in Aerospace. Today we're going to be talking about something that we use just about every day in our lives, but always don't recognize or realize that fact. Space-based imagery. This includes photographs of the recent hurricanes. Anybody here use Google Maps? Just about everybody. Good show of hands. Almost everything in Google Maps is from photography from space. Good afternoon, my name is Jim David. I'm a curator in the Space History Division here at the National Air and Space Museum. Today's speaker is Matt Kralovic. Matt is an intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps Reserve and a senior manager for end product engagement with Digital Globe. We're all going to have an opportunity to ask Matt questions at the end of his presentation. I'd like to start out, Matt, by just asking a, a general question. What can we photograph from space? So before we get to that, Jim, I just want to say thank you to the Smithsonian for having me here today. As a Washington, D.C. native growing up in this area, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is uh, just short of hallowed ground for an aerospace enthusiast. Uh, so thanks for having me here today. Also like to thank my company for providing a lot of the imagery that you'll see in this presentation. I'm not here representing Digital Globe today, nor am I here representing the US Marine Corps, but I want to thank Digital Globe for providing a lot of the imagery that we'll show you here today. Anyone who has worked with Marines knows that we like to keep things in threes. And if you ask the Air Force, that's because they'll tell you we can't count any higher. <laughs> but in addition to the one question you pose, what can I see from space? I'd like to also talk about how often you can see things from space, as well as how do we make sense of all that imagery there. And before we start, over on the slide that you're seeing, you'll see an image of San Francisco. And this is taken in 1999 by Iconos, the first high-resolution commercial imagery satellite. And as good an image as that is, it's a beautiful image, and very revolutionary for the time, things have actually gotten much better since that time. And we'll take you through a lot of images here today, Jim, which will show you just how things have evolved in terms of what we can see from space. So one of the things we can see from space, and when you work in this business, you learn that you, sometimes you get to see incredibly rare once in a lifetime events. Things that are far more rare than a solar eclipse and that you may never again see in your lifetime. In this case, what we're looking at is a Chicago Cubs World Series victory celebration. <laughs> and we're hoping, those who are Nats fans, that uh, this Friday we will prevent such an occurrence from happening again. But in terms of what we can see in this image, you can actually see individuals in here wearing uh, Cubs blue. You can see vehicles, and you probably can't tell from this resolution because you're not looking at a full resolution image. You can distinguish vehicle types, a great deal of detail from this image. When we talk about imagery and what you can see, we use a technical term called resolution. And when you're talking about resolution, what that generally means is the size of an object on the surface of the Earth that would show up as a pixel in that image. So it, roughly it means what you can see, what size object you can see in that given image. So smaller numbers are better when we're talking about resolution because that means the pixels are smaller and you're getting more detail. So here's an example of what one meter resolution looks like. One meter resolution, you can tell, you can pick out vehicles here, but you can't really tell what types they are. You can tell some general things about what you're looking at there. You can tell some of the destruction. This is a post-tornado image. But as we get progressively better, here's 82 centimeter imagery. This was the resolution of that imagery taken from that first commercial imagery satellite, Iconos, back in 1999. So this was the state of the art resolution back in 1999. 50 centimeter shows you a lot more. You can tell a lot more about the vehicles. You can tell a lot more about what actually happened there, the conditions of the uh, actual houses and structures there. And to give you a sense, this podium in front of us here, this table, is about 50 centimeters. So this would show up as a pixel on one of those images. But things have gotten progressively better. And since that time, we now have 41 centimeter and 31 centimeter imagery. Now, 31 centimeters, if you're wondering why 31 as opposed to some round number like 50. 31 centimeter is the resolution of Worldview 3. That is the highest resolution imaging, commercial imaging satellite from space. And you can see in here 
the incredible detail you can pull from this image. You can tell the vehicle types, you can see sunroofs on the vehicles, you can tell in one case uh, whether a car door is open on the vehicle, and you can pick out individuals on this. So for those who have seen Enemy of the State and are concerned that we're looking at your face from space, we are not. You can count people in these images, but I certainly can't tell you what color your hair is or anything of that nature. But you can confidently tell what are, what are people in this image. Uh, Matt, a quick question here. How many times do you have to magnify one of these images to get the maximum resolution? Good, good question, Jim. So this is digital, this is digital imaging. So there is no magnification, so to speak. When we take a huge image, many multi-kilometers by multi-kilometers, mm -hmm. this is the resolution throughout the image. And you would use a computer to actually zoom in on that image, just like you do in Google Maps on your phone. As you zoom in, you get progressively greater resolution. So let's bring this a little bit closer to home. Here's a picture of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum from 2002, and this is a quick bird image. And at the time, this was the state of the art, 60 centimeter resolution. You can tell that's pretty good. Uh, you, can tell the, you can see the food trucks, you can tell vehicles, but you can't really tell what types they are. And you can, see into, you can see things that might be people or they might be shrubs in this image. So let's look at what we're imaging today. Similar image. This is a Worldview 3 image from 2017. Again, the best commercial satellite imagery resolution from space. Notice in this one that you can confidently differentiate between the pedestrian barriers out front. You can tell the people crossing the crosswalks there. You can tell a lot about the vegetation and you can very clearly see the obelisk out front as well. So this gives you a sense of the uh, type of progression there's been in the capabilities of commercial Earth observation from space. So comparing this to some declassified historical reconnaissance program that's, that the US government has now made public, the images on the left that you're seeing <clears throat> are from the Corona Satellite Program. It's been declassified, but it's one of the earliest US government reconnaissance programs. And you can see there's some areas about town here. And I've taken imagery from Corona, which was 1.8 meter resolution. Remember, I told you sm when we're talking about resolution, smaller numbers are better. So this was 1.8 meter resolution. And I've put next to that the 31 centimeter resolution from Worldview 3 images today of those same locations. It may not fully show on the screen here, but you're getting 24 times as much information from those Worldview 3 images as you are from those Corona images from back in the 1960s. A quick question, Matt. Were the early imaging programs of the, both the United States and Soviet Union, their classified programs, their photo reconnaissance satellites, were they all black and white imagery? Yes. So the early photo reconnaissance capabilities, you're looking, what you're talking about, Jim, is the degree of the electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. that these satellites are imaging. And we'll talk in a few slides here. You'll notice that this imagery here that we're showing you is color imagery. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's, we have multi-spectral sensors which are able to pull out a specific spectrum and present that as we would see it with the human eye. All of this data we're pulling down is ones and zeros. So it doesn't come down as a photo, like from a traditional mm -hmm. camera. It comes down as ones and zeros, and then computer processing translates it into something that looks as much as possible like what you would see if you were looking out an airplane. So in this case, these are some before and after images of some of the Hurricane Harvey aftermath in uh, Houston, showing some of the flooding that took place there. And you'll notice this, this looks a lot like what you might see from an airplane flying over. And that's because we've taken those ones and zeros that are coming down from the satellite, and we've processed those into something that looks as much as possible like what your eye can see. And you can see the scale of the inundation there. So another way to discuss why is resolution important? Why is the detail of what you can get from these satellite images important? This is a ship that was conducting illegal fishing in the South Pacific. What most folks here can't tell, and I can't tell because I'm not a trained imagery analyst, is that this is also a slave ship where humans were impressed into conducting forced labor and then illegal fishing operations. There was a team of investigative journalists who looked at this image with a trained imagery analyst, and they were able to pull out so much detail from this, they could actually tell it was both illegal fishing as well as 
forced human labor. Mm -hmm. That allowed the authorities to then take action against this operation and actually shut it down. And that, for someone who's involved with the industry, is an incredible story. Because when we say 31 centimeter resolution, that's a pretty technical term that may not mean a lot to the general public. But what the general public does understand is that the fact that this imagery had this type of clarity and detail allowed us to, allowed the authorities to put this operation at rest. So that's a reason resolution matters. And this image, for example, uh, with digital globe satellites or many of the other uh, Earth observation satellites in orbit, this image is taken from 100 miles, 110 miles, 120 miles above the Earth? So anywhere between 300 miles, in our case, digital globes, anywhere between 300 miles and about 480 miles in space from a satellite that's moving about 17,000 kilom 17, miles mm -hmm. per hour, mm -hmm. about six kilometers per second. So 300 to 480, depending on which satellite, miles from Earth, moving at six kilometers per second. And that's the quality of imagery it's able to take. It's, it's remarkable. So for the audience, is there anyone in the audience who would like to take a guess as to what we are looking at in this image? Sir? Antarctica. Antarctica, absolutely. And any guesses, this is for bonus points, as to what those black dots are? Not quite rubble, but penguins. So we are able to actually count penguin populations from space. Good guess on Antarctica, by the way. We're able to count penguin populations from space. And there are a number of scientific applications of this. But just in case this resolution concept wasn't quite clear to you, the ability to count penguins from space hopefully makes it a little more tangible for you. Matt, is this done with other wildlife populations around the world? For example, elephants in Africa or Asia? Absolutely, Jim. And so there are, you bring up a, a great question. We do a lot of monitoring and we work with a lot of organizations that are dedicated to monitoring wildlife. Now, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. What you can do with penguins, it's much harder to do with, say, chimpanzee populations because they live in forested areas. So we're probably not going to count chimpanzees from space. However, what we can do is we can look at the habitats that they have and we can use certain properties of the sensors to make very detailed analysis of the specific habitats they live in. And that sometimes is a more uh, meaningful approach than trying to actually count the specific wildlife from mm -hmm. space. Elephants, in fact, we do because they're very, very large and have fairly uh, predictable migratory patterns. But speaking about some of what we do with the satellites that's beyond what you can count with your eyes. I mentioned earlier that we image beyond what your naked eye can see. So there's the visible spectrum that your naked eye can see. And we image specific bands within that spectrum and can pull those out to see things that your eyes can't normally pull out. And in addition to that, we in image in the infrared spectrum, the near infrared and shortwave infrared, to pull out additional information that your eyes can't detect to begin with. So what does that mean? And what do we do with that? Here's an example of one single image where we've played with those different bands to call out different features and to highlight different features in this image. So you can see, based on the band combinations of this multispectral data, in some of these strips, the vegetation is highlighted. In some strips, the water is highlighted to show moisture and, and make that more pronounced. So this takes that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes don't interpret readily, and using computers, we're able to pull that out and highlight it and see more than what our eyes can normally see. For this type of image, is it possible with your computer programs to get the entire image in the red band and then get the entire image in the blue band and change back and forth between these bands? Absolutely, Jim. And that's a very frequent application of this multispectral uh, capability is the ability to look at change between images using the various band combinations. And we'll show that in a, uh, a few slides here. So here's an example 
This is three different shots. On the left hand side, and they're just mountains, nothing particularly interesting about them until you start looking at the actual bands that we're working with here and what we can do with those. On the left hand side, you have panchromatic, which basically means black and white. So that's less than what your eye could see. In the middle, you have where we've put in some of the multispectral data to make it look like what your eye would see. So we would call that, we would call that a, uh, a true color type of image. It looks like what your eye would pick up. On the right hand side, we've added some of the shortwave infrared, and that's actually more than what your eye can see. And in this case, what those colors represent is those represent different geological formations. I can't tell you which ones they are specifically, but different rock types that have actually been called out that you would not be able to see with your naked eye. So you can imagine some of the applications there for mining and other uses for that type of technology. So the image on the far right, the trained analyst can determine these mountains are made of granite or sandstone or iron or some other element or material. Exactly right. And increasingly, we have computer programs which when trained analysts use them, they can do this at very large scale. And I'll talk a little bit about those towards the end of the presentation. So here's an example of that multispectral data. And you mentioned looking at change. This is the Fort McMurray wildfires. In 2016, Fort McMurray was devastated by wildfires. On the left-hand side of this image, what you're not looking at is red. You're not looking at fire here. What you're looking at is, in this case, we have told, we've made the image show healthy vegetation is red, using the near-infrared. So the left-hand side is before the fire. Over on the right-hand side, we've still shown healthy vegetation is red. But in this case, you can see how the fire has devastated the vegetation on the southern part of the river there. So that's exactly what you were talking about, Jim, in terms of the ability to compare between images and show change. And are those clouds on the right-hand side? Or so smoke from a lingering fire? Or yeah, so that is a, in fact, leads well into the next slide. That was, those were some smoke from lingering fires. And one of the capabilities that shortwave infrared gives you is the ability to actually see through that smoke. So here's the same two images you're looking at. On the left is what you would see if you were flying over an airplane and taking a photo. On the right is what we've done using shortwave infrared where we've composited out that smoke to see through it. And in addition, we've looked at the shortwave infrared to give some indications of the intensity of the fire that you're actually looking at there. So again, it takes it from not just removing the smoke, but also seeing characteristics that your eye could not pick up. So for example, firefighters would use the image on the right to determine this is where resources have to go. This is the hot spot or hot spots in this fire. That's exactly right, Tim. And one of the things we'll talk about at the end is really this imagery, it's not just about looking at uh, interesting things from space. This imagery has to be used to help make something actionable or drive a decision. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk later at the end of this presentation where just like you said, the goal here is to, is to make someone's life on the ground better. So whether it's mm -hmm. a first responder after Hurricane Harvey who now can make better decisions about delivering aid, or whether it's a firefighter who now knows the intensity of the fire in a given location, that's what it's all about. And that's what we wrap up the presentation with. So here's another example. Here's a volcano. This is what it would look like if you're flying over an airplane and taking a photograph. This is what it looks like when you apply that shortwave infrared spectrum where you can actually see the intensity of the lava there and the actual heat there. And notice that in this previous image, you might not notice that secondary lava flow below the uh, caldera. But in this one, with the shortwave infrared, next slide, please you actually notice that secondary lava flow as well. So more insight than what you'd get from your naked eye. So sometimes, despite our best efforts, what we get are pictures of clouds, beautiful, white, puffy clouds. And that's certainly not our goal. They're our nemesis, because we're trying to get pictures of the Earth most of the time. There is a sensor phenomenology that allows us to actually look through these. And that's synthetic aperture radar. And this is a capability we have in space as well. And this allows you to look through clouds. It allows you to image day or night, all weather. And there's some really powerful applications of this. The challenge, as you can see, is most synthetic aperture radar, it takes a skilled analyst to know exactly what they're looking at. Very rarely can you look at it. Sometimes you can, but oftentimes you need someone who's been trained to look at this, or a computer that's been trained to help pull out the relevant insight from that image. 
So there's probably some folks in the room who have the very logical question, well, that's neat. You can see a lot of things from space, but how often can you see them? And that is a very relevant question to the industry right now that I work in. So if anyone's interested in getting a sense of this on their own, I have a screenshot up there of the SpyMeSat app. And I actually have this on my phone right now, and you can download this. I think it's for free. And the SpyMeSat app will tell you when satellites are passing over your location and when they have an opportunity to image you. So in this case, I can tell in uh, 11 minutes and 45 seconds, we're going to have a Korean satellite that's going to be flying over and have an imaging opportunity in this area. I can tell that we're going to have a few more, another Korean one. Here's a European one. Worldview 1 will come by at 147. But if you download this app, you're going to see that anywhere you go in the world, you have multiple overpasses. And you'll be amazed at the frequency of how often there are satellites which can see you from space. One key note here, though, is just because a satellite's flying over you doesn't mean it's taking a picture of you. Satellites look left, they look right, they look forward, they look back. So just because a satellite is passing over doesn't mean they're taking a picture of you. And it doesn't certainly mean that you're ending up with someone looking at that picture of you as well. So for those who are concerned about the frequency, sleep a little bit easier. Do the cameras on, on the satellites operate 24-7? So that's Obviously, in each uh, uh, orbit of the Earth, one half the orbit is in the dark and one half is in the light. But there are sensors, as you mentioned, that can image during conditions of darkness. So we want our satellites, speak as a digital globe person here, we want our satellites working as hard as possible all the time. However, when you're talking about an optical satellite, we are largely confined to hours of daylight for that. We call mm -hmm. that the descending node of the orbit. Ascending, mm -hmm. ascending node is usually on the dark side mm -hmm. of the Earth. Now, that synthetic aperture radar I told you about, that can image whether it's night or day. So it's a complicated, uh, like most things in space, mm -hmm. it's a simple question with a complicated mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. But in general, satellite providers want to keep their satellites working as hard as possible all the time in space, particularly for optical uh, satellites during the daylight hours. So when we talk about how often things get imaged, it's worth talking a little bit about the size of satellites because the two are tied together. If you'll notice on the right-hand side of this, you have a minivan. But next to that, you have Digital Globe Worldview 3, and that's called a flagship class satellite. That's one of my company's satellites, and there is a one-quarter scale model of this out in your exhibit here. There's also very great things on Corona as well, so I'd encourage folks to go out and look at some of these exhibits. They're incredible. But you have a one-quarter scale model of Worldview 3. Worldview 3 is a large satellite by commercial standards. That's why it's one of the most capable. As you move down the spectrum over to the left there, you'll see satellites getting progressively smaller. And you'll see over on the left-hand side, you have companies like Planet, Planet now, not Planet Labs. You have Black Sky, Terrabell. They're building small sats. And their goal in building these is to put larger constellations, and when I say constellation, that just means a fleet of satellites, larger constellations in orbit of smaller satellites that can see more of the Earth at higher temporal revisit. So that's a different business model, uh, as you'd imagine. Digital Globe, Worldview 3, those tend to be higher resolution, higher accuracy. And the ones on the left, the more they put up, the higher the temporal type of revisit they can get. So see things more often. So here's a quick graph of the anticipated launches. And this is a little bit dated, but uh, this is how many launches and how many satellites folks expect to be in orbit. And that speaks to those small satellite constellations and the proliferation of those, which is more and more satellites up there who want to re get higher temporal revisit, see the Earth more often, to just try to solve some of the challenges that may be oriented towards seeing the Earth more often, but not necessarily in as high a resolution. So these are a few of the companies who are involved in those high revisit type of applications and seeing the Earth more often. As you can imagine, in this paradigm, you've got a lot of data coming down from space. And all that data, we won't get to this, unfortunately. This was the third question, Jim. We'll have to cut it off. But how do you make sense of all that data is the great challenge that the industry and, in fact, even the US government is dealing with right now. And I'll leave you with this quote 
from the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which speaks to that and the challenges there. Matt, we're going to have you come back and address this last issue. Question and answer time. Does anybody from the audience have any questions for Matt? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, so as we push toward getting higher resolution images more frequently, uh, I just think about the size of that file. Um, so until we could figure out the right way to make sense of all the data and fully process it, uh, how much of a concern is storage for all of these um, images? That is a, an incredibly on-target question because that's the question that our corporate leadership and the U.S. government wrestle with every single day. How do you store this data? And more importantly, how do you process it to make something make sense of it all? So there, are, there is an intersection right now between all this data coming down from space and cloud computing and storage, which has really opened this up. So I'll just say that there is a, there are a lot of, uh, you've, you've posed the right question, and some of the smartest folks I know are really working on that using advancements in computer technology and cloud computing to solve that challenge that you just brought up. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have a quick question? Yes, sir. Wondering if you could explain what synthetic aperture is and does it affect resolution? So that is a, boy, that is a tough question. Uh, synthetic aperture is, quickly. Yeah, synthetic aperture is where a, a, a radar system has an aperture. Synthetic aperture takes advantage of the movement of satellite through space to simulate having a very large aperture. The movement of the satellite simulates the, what would normally be a very large dish through space. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss resolution, but there's many applications. It's fascinating and spend a lifetime studying it. Matt, thank you very much for a very informative and educational presentation today. I and I think everybody else have learned an awful lot. We want to thank the audience that has seen the presentation. And lastly, we'd like to thank Boeing, the sponsor of What's New in Aerospace. Thanks, Matt, Thanks, very Jim. much. Appreciate it.